Hi, I'm George and welcome to the 23rd episode of the Horizon project. In this video, we're going to have a look at finishing the Horizon launcher. Now, it's actually taken a little bit more work than what we were originally expecting. Uh, so this video covers about a month worth of design, sourcing materials, then actually building it and painting it uh, as well. Now, if you're watching this video in 2020 and you're about to skip it and he head out, why not stay home instead and uh, watch the whole video? Now, if you're watching it in 2021, you can feel free to skip it and go out with your friends. So let's have a look at the details. Before buying any steel for the base, we needed to set up the booster mock-up again on the prototype frame to figure out how high the base of the rocket needed to be so that we could load it without spilling any water. And we also wanted to have enough ground clearance to load the sustainer easily. When we were happy with the setup, we put it all back into the CAD and measured up all the pieces that we were going to need. Then it was time to head over to Edcon Steel, our local steel supplier. We gave them a list of all the things that we needed, and while waiting for it all to be cut up, we oogled over their selection of profiles and material choices. This was certainly going to be the heaviest launcher we've ever built. They even packed it up nicely for us. And then it was back home to start the production. We started with the central tiltable platform base. This thing is going to see the highest forces on it, and so it's made from the heavier RHS. The edges then needed cleaning up. Here we're drilling holes for the M12 bolts that will support the tilting platform. And a bit of Dremel action to clean up the holes on the inside. We'd love to show you the process of the base getting welded up, but neither of us can weld and so we've had to leave it to the experts. So we took the pieces back to Edcon Steel Fabrication Shop this time to get them welded. It took a couple of days to slot it into their busy schedule, so we don't have video, but we suspect the welding looked something like this. The guys at the fabrication shop did a great job and even ground the welds to a nice flush finish. And they also made sure the tiltable platform was also well aligned. So that's the platform base done. The H-frame that stabilizes the entire launcher was next. The lengths of RHS were already cut to the right length from the supplier, and so we really only needed to deburr the cuts. Who would have thought 10 years ago we'd be grinding structural steel when building water rockets? But here we are. We again needed to make a ton of holes in all of the segments. To join them all together, we needed to make a set of brackets. We cut these off a 40 by 40 millimeter and three millimeter thick steel angle. And time to clean these cuts as well. And here they are finished, ready to be fitted. The reason we went with steel for the frame rather than wood or aluminium is because weight isn't an issue. It's cheaper than aluminium, but mostly because it's so rigid. Normally you'd probably want to weld this as well, but we needed to be portable, so we just bolted together. And that's the H-frame complete. You might have noticed how awkward it was trying to load the booster onto the launch tubes. And it would be even worse when it was full of water. So we decided to build a cart and a ramp that would support and align the booster while threading it onto the launch tubes. We started with the cart. It's just made from wood as it only needs to support about 20 kilos. The ends are made from marine ply and the rest is just dressed pine.
without wheels, the cart would be just a shelf. Well, in fact, we plan on using the cart as a support for the booster when it's not out on the launch pad. Uh, that will let us work on the booster while we prep it at the flight line. The track is made from the same steel angle we saw earlier. It needs to be 3 meters long to get enough clearance past the launch tubes when the boost is sitting on the cart. Then we cut up the cross bracing to join the two tracks together. We'll keep the entire track as one unit for transportation. Again, this is something that should probably be welded up in real life. Here we're drilling holes in the track for the cross bracing. The screws will be countersunk so that the cart wheels can run over them. This stuff will rust pretty quickly out in the open, so we give it a nice coat of paint. We're using some rust guard satin finish on the steel. Uh, we haven't used this paint before, so we'll see how well it does. The whole track then gets assembled. and the track is ready to go. Now it was time to bring all the major components together. We wanted to see what interfered with what and what heights things needed to be adjusted to. We just used a bunch of wooden blocks to prop everything up. The first issue to look at was to make an adjustable support for the track. Because the lower end of the track may not always lie on exactly level ground, we needed a way to adjust the height of the nozzle end of the track so that it would line up exactly with the launch tubes. For this, we decided to use a car jack. Shh, don't tell dad, he does know it's from his car. This would easily take the load and let us make fine adjustments at the launch site. To mount the jack to one of the H-frame beams, we added a couple of angle brackets. And the jack is attached to those with a set of four bolts. We made a simple pivoting bracket for the top of the jack and this will attach to the track itself. And that's one end of the track supported. To support the other end of the track, we built a small foot from some wooden offcuts we had lying around. This end is just going to sit directly on the ground. It doesn't need to be adjustable, just as long as it's always lower than the nozzle end of the track. It also doesn't need to be exactly leveled, uh, it's not critical at this end of the track. The foot has a wide base to stop it from tipping over. And we also gave it a nice coat of paint. Next it was time to make the scuba tank support bracket. Its end supports are again made from marine ply and the rest is dressed pine again. The supports are made from 19mm pine and these will support the scuba tanks themselves. This then just gets screwed together. This bracket stops the scuba tanks from rolling around and also provides the correct spacing for them so that the cross connect can be connected and there's no uneven forces on it. The entire bracket is designed to sit on the frame itself rather than on the ground, so that the weight of the scuba tanks helps stabilize the entire launcher. 
We'll use this bracket to transport the scuba tanks as well to stop them rolling around in the van. The whole thing then gets pulled apart and painted. The launch control box needs to be elevated so that the hoses can reach the tilting platform. So we decided to make a simple support frame from bits of timber we had lying around the house. This frame needs to be open because the launch control box vents water and air down below it if we need to abort a launch. After it gets screwed together, we give it a coat of some waterproof paint. This is the same paint we used on the control box. While it would be easier for one of the kids to hold the rocket vertical during launch, neither of them would volunteer and so we needed to make a guide rail brace to hold it up. Here we're mounting the brace directly to the base. It would have been nice to just have one of the vertical base legs continue all the way up, but it would have made the base a lot more difficult to transport and so we went with a separate brace that can be removed. Next we needed to make the guide rail that would attach to the pivoting platform. Because the actual guide rail was going to be quite a ways from the vertical brace, we added a backing rail to the actual guide rail that would put it closer to the vertical brace. This is just made from an aluminium square section. The guide rail itself is made from an aluminium 1010 profile, which seems to be a kind of a standard in the model rocket circles. Here we're only temporarily attaching the rail, its final position will be based on the final diameter of the booster. We 3D printed a number of components that would allow the brace to securely hold the guide rail and the rocket vertically. The handle cover will just be glued on with a little bit of super glue. Here we're threading the spacer onto the back of the rail with a couple of long bolts. These bolts then go through the backing rail and attach to the outer spacer. The locking bolt then goes through both spaces, this will make sure that the rocket is securely locked vertically. Then we just add a cap to stop water getting in during launch. The RHS will also get a cap once it is painted. So let's have a look how the launcher will be set up at the launch site and how it will be used. First we assemble the base and the H-frame. The whole frame will be leveled after the rocket is put onto the launch pad so we can see even minor deviations. Then the scuba tank support bracket gets put on the frame. The track can then be mounted on the car jack. The mounting brackets allow the track to pivot up and down. On the other end of the track we attach the support foot. Again the mounting bracket allows the foot to pivot around it. This allows us to more easily adjust the track angle. The guide rail support brace is next and is bolted on with a couple of big bolts. The pivoting platform and guide rail can be fitted next. The platform is held in place by a couple of long M12 bolts. Now we can secure the platform to stop it from tipping over. This lets us easily work on the platform. Launch tubes are up next. These get screwed into the nozzle seats. We made this custom spanner that can tighten the launch tubes. The launch control box support just sits on the ground. And the launch control box goes on top of that. Once that's in place, we can connect one end of the high pressure hoses to the control box. Then we tip the platform over so that we can attach the other end of the hoses to the launch tubes. And then we lock the platform vertical again. 
The scuba tanks then get put onto the support bracket. The weight of the tanks helps hold the hull launcher down. The cross connect goes on next. Yeah. Here is fun fact number 48. Each launch uses about 2 kilos of air. This high pressure yoke is next. And this connects all the air to the back of the launch control box. We now adjust the track to the correct height so we can properly load the rocket. The cart just sits on the track like this. The brake is then applied to stop it sliding down the track. We carefully place the empty booster on the cart. Because the track is sloping away from the launcher, we can now fill the booster segments with water without the water draining out of the rocket. About 3 litres go into each of the segments. Now we can lower the launch tubes and align them with the nozzles. We can then slide the full booster onto the launch tubes until the release mechanism will lock in place. We don't have that fitted here for the mock-up. The sustainer is filled with water next. It's then loaded into the booster. Because the sustainer is also angled downward, it won't spill the water out of it. It slides in until it locks into the release mechanism. Again, this isn't fitted here. When the rocket is down like this, we need to support the end of the sustainer because all the water is near the nose cone. We are now ready to lift the rocket. At this point, all the water will flow from the top end of the rocket to the lower end. and then also gets locked into place. We will level the launcher at this stage to make sure that the rocket is pointing exactly vertical. Once we are ready for launch, we stand up a support sitting inside of the cart and then slide the cart down the track a little and lock it off. The rocket gets lowered carefully onto this support. This makes sure the water stays at the bottom of the rocket, but allows us full access to arm all the electronics and cameras in the booster and also in the sustainer. Once everything's armed and running, we can put the rocket back up, lock it in place and retreat to the relative safety of the flight line ready to pressurize the rocket. So that's the launcher. There's still little bits to be done to it, but it's mostly finished. Uh, next, we're going to start looking at the booster itself. Uh, first, we're gonna create a test article for pressure testing and getting the right sides molds and everything. Uh, if you've got any questions about the launcher or any of the processes, please leave them in the comments below. We also had the opportunity to work on a collaborative video with Grady from the awesome Practical Engineering channel. I've left the link up here, I think it's up here, uh, to the video. And while you're there, why not check out some of his other videos? He does a great job of explaining how things work. Uh, anyway, stay safe and thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.